want to speak this evening on the subject of a total transformation. We read here in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. Are you the sort of person who likes to think that they are truly independent? You have your own thoughts. You determine your own path in life. You make your own choices. You're not driven by the fashions and by the expectations of the crowd around you. Well, in this message, Paul challenges us to see what really drives and what shapes us. He calls us to seek a total transformation into what pleases God and not the crowd which is around us. When I was at university many years ago, it was on an evening a little like this, coming towards summer. And I can remember going to an evening service and this was the text of the preacher it was coming towards summer I'd invited a friend from university to come this individual had said no many many times but that night that night they came and this was the text and it came as a complete shock the person did not have a church upbringing and afterwards, she said to me, this was completely radical thinking, radically different from her understanding of Christianity. It was such a different message, and it had really made her think and challenged her thinking. Well, I trust that that might be the same tonight. This is particularly a message for the young, those who are older, I'm afraid to say you have already been shaped and moulded by this world. And for some, well, it's never too late. If it was not too late for the thief on the cross, it's not too late for anyone. But for the majority, the older you get, the more shaped you've become, the more moulded by this world, as we shall explain, and the harder it is to see your life as God sees it. So this is a message particularly for the young. It's a warning. I want it to come as a little bit of a surprise to jolt you, to stop you in your tracks, to make you realise that if you carry on in life in the way that Paul describes here, you will be shaped and you will be moulded. This is one of those standout, pop off the page texts. It makes us think, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I want to explain as simply as possible what these words mean. Just to go through word by word, there's five key words in this text. And then we shall bring it together. But before we look at any text in the Bible, it's so important for us to look at the context, to look at the way Paul is arguing, the explanations that he's given, so that we don't wrench this out of context. Although in many ways it's a, a verse which does stand alone and it has a meaning which doesn't need the context, but... There are valuable things here in the context which add even more. These two chapters, chapter 12 and chapter 13 of Romans, they're dealing with the responsibilities that we each have in life, the God-given responsibilities that every single human being, that you and me, that we have all the way through our lives, as soon as that we're of an age of understanding. Each one of these responsibilities rest 
upon our shoulders. Some of them, they grow in life the older we get. At the end of chapter 13, we'll just go in reverse. We, we hear Paul expressing in verses 8 to 14 the responsibility that we have, each of us, to our neighbours. That's very important, particularly in this pandemic. We may be at a distance, but we have a duty, a God-given duty, to show acts of kindness, to show responsibility to the hungry, to those in need, to the elderly. It may be to a family. It may be to somebody else. This is God's way. It's a gracious way. It's the way he's ordered society. But then, coming backwards at the beginning of chapter 13, the first seven verses speak of our duties to government, those that rule us. In civil society, the way that God has organised life, as he's organised governments and rulers, you don't need many people living together before there's a need for a government. I used to have a fascination with a small island off the west coast of Scotland called St Kilda. I don't think the population ever went much higher than 100 or 150, but they had to have a government. They had to have elders to determine what the work pattern should be. There wasn't much theft and crime because everybody knew everybody else's business. But there was government there. And government is one of God's gracious provisions. He organised and gave government to organise society. But then at the end of chapter 12, there is that responsibility that we have to society in general. It's there from verses 3 and onwards. Our duties to our employers. Employers' duties to their employees. The responsibilities that we have to show kindness and to distribute to those in need. And these are good things. They're God-given things. Don't ever think that God is a capricious God an angry God who doesn't shower the world with blessings. These are all his gifts. These are all his doing. These are all his purposes. And then we come back to Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. And this is where it all begins. We can't be kind and gracious to our neighbours, obedient to government, take our responsibility to society unless God has first helped us to see our responsibilities to him. And these two verses, if we were to sum them up, they are all about how I must relate to God. It says, let's look through them, I beseech you, this is Paul speaking, I beg you, I urge you, therefore, Brethren, he's speaking to Christians in the main. By the mercies, by the kindness of God, present your bodies. God has given you a life, a body, faculties, functions, abilities. He's given you eyes. He's given you ears. How are you going to use them? Are you going to use them for yourself? Or are you going to use them for God? And Paul pleads, right at the beginning, before these other responsibilities, I beg you, use your body, use your life, use your energy, your breath, use it for God. He takes the analogy of the sacrificial system. He says, do you remember the Old Testament Jews? They would take an animal. And that would be a dead sacrifice. It would be given once, once a day, once a week, once a year, depending upon what type of animal and where they were in the calendar. But you, you don't need to do it once. You need to present your life, 
your body, your faculties as an ongoing, continual sacrifice to God. Not a photo, but a whole video through life. And that's what God sees. He doesn't see just the snapshots of when you're showing your best and the kind deeds that sometimes we do, I trust, all of us. But he wants to see a living sacrifice. From the time you're born until the time you die, your whole body, your whole life should be given to God. Why? Well, Paul says, it should be holy because this is well-pleasing, acceptable unto God. And then he finishes with that, the verse with those two words, your reasonable, your rational, your logical, your right service to God. Look at what God has done for me and for you. He's given you life. He's given you breath. He's given you a soul. He's given you 10 years so far, maybe 15, 20. Maybe you've had good health. Maybe you've been in a stable family, maybe not. Maybe you've had an education, which so many in the world don't have. Maybe you've never been wanting for food. No thanks to God. No presenting your life back to God and say, Lord, you've given all this to me. You've given me so much. It's the very least that I can do to return my life, my energy back to God. It's reasonable, it's right, it's fair that the God who's given me everything should just have something, the best I can give, my life, my soul, my energy, my all. Love so divine demands my soul, my life, my all, says the hymn writer. Well, we look at these things tonight. Of course, also society tells us how we should live. Society tells us what is socially acceptable. It's not always right. Society is a form of crowd. There are expectations put on you. Young people, there are certain trainers you can wear and can't wear. You can't wear them. Oh no, that's not a brand I recognise. Couldn't you afford the proper one? There's certain things that you need to do with your time to be part of the crowd to be an it person, socially acceptable, seen to be one of the crowd. Well, tonight I don't want to consider what the crowd considers as socially acceptable. We need to be concerned with what God calls well-pleasing and acceptable in his sight. That word is used twice in verse 1. And verse 2, acceptable unto God. And then at the end of verse 2, acceptable and the perfect will of God. There is a way that God wants us to live. It's a good way. It's a right way. It's the best way. There's nothing about it that has a bitter taste. There's nothing about it that will backfire. There's nothing about it that will make your life one tiny bit miserable. It's the opposite. A life of freedom. A life of joy. A life of trials. But a life of overcoming trials with God's help and God's strength. Well, these things are right. Is it right that God should tell me how to live? It's my life says one. I'll determine. No one's going to rule over me, we might think. Maybe in the teenage years, 
we were all like it once. Those rebellious years, as sometimes we call them. Not everybody goes through those. Some people sail through, and they never have that rebellious streak. They see the wisdom in their parents. They see that their parents want what's good and what's right. But others, they hear the voice of reason speaking to them, as Paul is, on behalf of God, the message of God. And we don't like it. I will self-determine. I will say what's right for me. I'll determine how I use my body, how I use my life, what I spend my time doing. Well, let's just look at these words that are here before us this evening. This is going to be a command. Be not a command from God. It's not a question. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. Be not conformed. Well, let's just explain these five words. They're illustrations within words when we look at their original. The first word, conformed. I'm sure you may have worked this out already. Be not conformed. We get from this Greek word, the word schematic. There is a shaping, a scheme, a pattern that you are being put into. You take a form of metal, perhaps one that has a low melting point. You heat it up, whatever it is, 200, 300 degrees, and you pour it into the mould. And as it cools, you've been shaped. The metal has formed the pattern that was intended for it. Maybe we can think of plasticine. I don't know whether we use that nowadays. That's what it used to be called. Putty, the thing that goes round windows. You can put your fingerprints into it. That's the picture, conformed. Here's my life. And there's a pattern and a shape being pushed into your life. Whether you like it or not, you're being conformed, schematized, shaped. That's literally what it means. But then the second word, what am I being shaped into? Conformed to this world. Now the word for world is not the one that describes the globe and the people and all the people of the world. No, it's a word which means the system of thinking. The things that we pursue, our value system, what we put worth and value next to. And this word is describing to us that there is a shaping into the mould and pattern and the way of thinking of this world. So we put the two words together. Paul is saying, be careful. You are going to be shaped and you're like putty in the hands of the world, like plasticine, blue tack, moulded, shaped into a uniform shape. It's the same shape. It's the way the world thinks. Well, what does the world think about? The world thinks about my appearance, the outward rather than the inward. The world says, ignore the monotony of life that's actually designed to help us to think of eternity and not just the things of now. The world says, think of superstition. Think of things that suit and please. Do things that just please yourself. Superstitious things. Things which are a pattern that please you. The world says, go with the majority. The majority can never be wrong. Majority, democracy is always right. The crowd can't be wrong. 
Well, the crowd shouted, crucify him. The crowd shouted something that was utterly unjust. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who had done no sin, and yet the verdict of the crowd was crucify him. Take him and give him the vilest form of death. No, the crowd can't be wrong according to the crowd. The crowd says, I don't need God. I can cope. Sometimes we hear of people. They've reached a low ebb. They've come to a position in life where perhaps their body has deteriorated. They have some form of illness. Maybe COVID-19. Maybe cancer. Everything else has got weak. But still, they're defiant. I can cope. I'll battle cancer. I'll cope. I'll manage. Well, it's good to have a positive attitude in illness. But we must ever remember that our lives are in God's hands. Our lives are rolled out by him and he determines the number of days. Man says, what does this world think? Man says, everything in moderation. Is that right? Drugs? Alcohol? Blasphemy? Everything in moderation? That's the wisdom of this world. Man says, eat, drink and be merry. Have fun. Because tomorrow I die. Is that right? You've got a soul that will live forever. Tomorrow you might die, but your soul will meet your maker. Man says, everyone for himself. Man says, well, as long as it makes him happy, he can do what he likes. Oh, what the rubbish we believe. What nonsense sayings we hear that describe the shallow thinking of the world. Well, let's look at this third world. Be not shaped according to the thinking of the world, but be transformed. You know this word. It's the same word as the transfiguration. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ, high in glory, equal with the Father and the Spirit. He comes down to earth and he takes on a human flesh. He puts aside his Godhead for those 33 years. And then he goes up into the mountain and he shows his disciples. He gives them just a glimpse of his glory. He's transfigured. He's literally changed from one state into another. It's the word we use in biology, metamorphose, to be changed from a caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly, to be changed from an immature condition and state into the way that God intended us to be, able to fly, free, not crawling and creeping along the ground, like an insect, but able to soar, able to have a perception, a perspective, a view of life, like the frog spawn to the frog, perhaps not such a pretty picture, but the point is, it's a total transformation that Paul is describing. He's described what's going to happen to every young person. You're going to be stamped, shaped, molded but there can be a change a total transformation is this a good change is it a necessary change oh yes it's necessary because if you carry on you'll get more and more defined in your thinking more stubborn you'll have taken on more of the propaganda that's designed to be anti-God, that's designed to saturate your life with pleasure lust. 
and with heart lust and with the pride of life. Is it necessary? Oh yes. Is it good? Oh, it's thoroughly good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Everything God plans and purposes for my life and for your life is thoroughly good. It says it here, verse 2, that ye may prove, that you may show, that you may approve, that you may test and trial and demonstrate what is that good, the good will that God has for your life. The good and well-pleasing purpose, that's what acceptable means. And the perfect, the complete. You see, when I'm outside of God, I'm so incomplete. I'm like the caterpillar, crawling around the ground, looking for scraps, maybe climbing onto a leaf, but leading such a limited life like the frog spawn, just swimming in the water, floating like an amoeba. But now I can move, the butterfly flies, the frog jumps. All of a sudden, I can change. This is what God will do. How can it happen? Is it possible? Oh yes, there it is in verse 2. Be transformed by the renewing, the revival, the bringing of new life to your mind, to your soul, to your heart. How does it work? Well, I have a desire. I start with a desire. I don't want a limited life anymore. I don't want to be shamed. I thought I was free, but now I realise I was being shaped by the world and I wasn't free at all and now I want what God wants for my life. I realise I have such a limited life, I have a desire and God puts such a burning desire into individuals' hearts so I go to prayer. I say, Lord God, renew my mind, I can't do this. I need the Holy Spirit to come. I need him to change my heart, my mind, and then my life so that I can have what God always wanted for my life. What's the will of God? God's will is that no one should perish. God's will is that all might come to know him. God's will is that all might repent of sin. God's will is that we would cease to do evil and seek to do well. This is the good will of God. This is what God wants for your life and for my life. My friends tonight, young people especially, don't live a life away from God. Don't allow yourself to be shaped and moulded and conformed. This is a wicked world. This is a world that has so much thinking <clears throat> that's being stamped through the education system, through the media, through so many outlets of technology. And step by step, day by day, one picture at a time, one movie after one movie, you're being formed and shaped into what God does not like. Into something which is the total opposite of the things that God loves. My friends tonight, you can only present your body and your life as a living sacrifice. Holy, pure, separate and acceptable unto God if first the Lord has washed your sin, cleansed your soul, put that old life away and given you a new heart, 
which desires to be shaped by God and conformed to the image of his will, God's perfect plan for your life. My friends tonight, live life for God. If you've lived life up until now for self, seek him tonight. Go and find a place, call out to him, ask for that renewing of your mind and of your heart and you will find what is good, well-pleasing and complete the will of God for your life. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, our loving Father, we thank thee for the tender words of God, revealing to us what we do not want to hear. We pray that there would be some souls, some souls tonight, that see what they've never seen before and hear what they've never heard before. God speaking to them. Lord, we want to be the people that God always intended. We want to have the lives that God wants us to live, that well-pleasing and acceptable life, living for God, living for eternity. And, O oh Lord, we pray it may be so. We ask in the Lord Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Amen.